in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. As God's will, he will move. He will operate. He will display his presence and his glory. So the manifest presence that we're talking about, the manifest glory that we're talking about, is the working of God actively as he wills at a certain place, certain time, in a specific situation or situations. Example, healing. Healing is a very common manifest presence of God is that we mistakenly will know, oh, yeah, that's the move of God. Somebody got healed. That's the manifest presence of God. We always pursue healings in this house because it is something that God had promised, and he said that he would heal, and when he heals, we know that there is a manifest presence of God taking place. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, every revival, every revival that had, 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 had happened over the past always involve some sort of supernatural manifest presence of God, i.e. healing. And not only healing, you know, the first, you know, the Azusa revival, of course, started this uh, Pentecostal movement called the tongue movement. You know, people begin to fill with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongue. That's another manifest presence or the glory of God. When you speak in tongues, when, when believers gather together and the Holy Spirit touch them and they all speak in tongues. You know, the problem is a lot of times we try to manufacture the presence of God by doing the acts of the manifest presence of God that had been in, on display in the past. Do you understand what I mean? Well, you and I need to be careful. We don't try to act out the manifest presence of God. Then you are manufacturing the presence of God. We have to be careful. You know, this church, we always say we, we got to be real. We cannot be religious. Religious doesn't only mean that just it's liturgical. Religious doesn't mean that just, you know, observing law. Sometimes we, you know, so-called Pentecostal or charismatic people, we are religious in our acts because we act out what we believe is the manifest presence of God without the manifest presence of God. We have to be careful for that. So anyways, the other example it would be healings of the soul. You know, as this church being opened up, there all we, every week we have visitors, tons of visitors coming through here, even during this so-called low season, you know, when everybody's asleep, you know, on, on the last Sunday of the week, and we still have visitors visiting us, you know. Um, no condemnation, by the way. So if you're watching, no condemnation. But, you know, if, you, if you're visitors, you know, we have met many visitors that had come in with broken heart. And how they told us God healed them. We have seen people stay in church, just become, the visitors were the last people that left this place because they were weeping and crying and thanking the Lord for healing their heart, for coming to the understanding how they had been so broken and they didn't even know that they were broken. And they didn't understand their behavior came from the fact that they are broken and how God would mend them, heal them. That's the manifest presence and glory of God. The manifest presence or the manifest glory of God or the glory of God is when he makes himself unmistakably known. People experience the glory of God as, as a kind of weight. You know, the word glory actually means weighty. The, glo the word glory, when people say, I sense the glory of God, it actually means that they sense that weight of God. I don't know if you've ever come to the place where you, you were worshiping God, and it's ex I experience that all the time. You just cannot help but just to fall on your knees because the glory of God is so weighty on you. You know, when Jesus was being arrested 2,000 years ago, and when he declared in John that I am, people fell under. Why? Because there was a manifest presence of God immediately invade that space. And people just didn't understand it, but they fell down. Why? Because there was such a weight 
of the glory of God. You know, I pray that this church, we will, every time when we come into the time of worship and praise, we don't take that lightly. It's not a sing-along. It's not a sing-spiration. It's not some musical performance. It's not some sort of drama. It's nothing. The worship team, we don't emphasize on talents, but we seek for the glory of God. When we invite people from the congregation to worship God, we don't just want to invite them to look at our performance because we know our performance in of itself suck. We not, we not, Mr. McKenzie, he's not here this morning, right? He, we not, you know, Carlo McKenzie with his amazing, you know, even if there is such a skill, and I know we have many talented people. I don't want to belittle their talent. You know, I saw Chelsea was practicing her piano on uh, Instagram. Her sister just taped it without her knowing it. She was amazing, <laughs> right? Chelsea was on the keyboard, but you will know it because that's not what we, are manif- what we are emphasizing. You know, Uncle Rob, who taught Chelsea, he's not even anywhere. It's not because we despise talent. It's because we emphasize on the presence. We don't want you to see the musicians. We don't want you to see the singers. We want you to experience and have an encounter with God. When you leave this place, after the worship, after the preaching, if you walk out of the place and say, boy, that was a great music, and there was a funny preacher, then we haven't done our job. But when we walk out of this place, you say, man, I just, God just touched me today. My mind has just been transformed and changed. My thinking has changed. I sense the presence of God. I'm healed. My bones, the, the arms that I couldn't move, now I couldn't move. Praise the Lord. I was sick when I walked in. Now I'm healed. Then we have done our job. Then we can say we have met the glory of God. Otherwise, we're just wasting time. Every week, you know, millions of Christians across this land going through the motion. Some of the younger ones actually got smart. They said, well, I don't want to spend my time in this nothing. They are right. Because religious thing doesn't do anything for them or for God. But we're seeking for that weight, for the weight that will just, God will just show up. Some people describe that that weight, sometimes it feels so thick you can cut a hole through it and eat it. That's what we seek, the presence and the glory of God. You know, we talk a lot about grace in this church. You know, the grace of God is a lot harder than people presume it to be. A lot of people think it's just a, a, a permissive gospel. You know, they have a name called antinomianism, but it's not. The grace, when it is operating, it's, it needs God. Because how can you forgive ISIS? Grace of God is like, oh, you can sin all you want. No, grace of God is his belief. With the ability for you to do the impossible. Some of you are going to meet people walking into this church that they may not not act like you, believe like you, but I pray for that grace to come upon you to embrace them and love them. That's the grace of God. Don't judge them. Oh, that's another grace. It's so hard for Christians not to judge. We need the grace not to judge. We grew up judging we learn how to judge. We saw our preachers judge. They talk about things that they don't like, and they condemn people straight to hell every Sunday. Oh, we need the grace of God to say, no, we're going to lift people up. We're going to strengthen them. We're going to pick them up. We're going to be like the father who saw their children and want to give grace to their children. And we will allow the grace of God to pass, pass even a, a way past our level that we need God in. You know, I always say we, we Christian often just allow grace to come to us, to, come, to go to as far as where we at. So if we, if we steal something, we need the grace of God. But woe to those who murder somebody because it's way much worse. How can they have the grace of God? But we need to allow the grace of God pass through our level, go as deep as it, as it can be, and it can go really deep. We were just joking around the other day, you know, how would you like when you see Hitler in heaven? <gasps> oh, my God. Who knows what happened? In the last minute, he repented. Who knows? I'm not saying he did. 
But he gave his heart to Jesus, and the grace of God came to him. Well, anyway, so the grace of God is also the glory. The magnificent display of the grace of God is also a form of the manifest presence of God. Supernatural love is another form. I can go on and on. You know, in Scripture, wherever God shows up His glory to any of His servants, you remember the time when many prophets, they would say that I saw the Lord and He touched me and I fell like dead. That's the, that's the manifest glory of God. You know, in charismatic churches, we often do this slain in the spirit act. We have a catcher, which is fine. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. But a lot of times we do it, you know, us preachers, let me tell you some secrets about us preachers, okay? We talk about the thing called mercy drop. How many have heard of mercy drop before? Mercy drop is that we, the preacher, pray and pray and pray and pray. Sometimes some of them have such a bad breath, we just want to avoid that. So we just went down anyway so they can get it over with. Feel sorry for the guy. So we have a mercy drop. But when it's the glory of God, man, you, you would forget about you dropping. It would be so sudden, boom, hit you. And when you wake up, you know, I read the accounts of all the revival in the past of people just being literally just slain by the Spirit, as it were. And it's, it's a charismatic term, right? Slain by the Spirit, just, just boom, down on the floor. And when they, when they woke up, they find themselves speaking in tongues and see the glory of God. And they woke up, it'd be like five hours later. I double dog dare you next time. When somebody pray for you, don't let them push you down. Do, do this. Stand firm. <laughs> to make a point, I'm in for the real thing. I'm not doing this game. Come on, praise the Lord. Some preacher, they push you, push you, push you. God have mercy on them. You just stand firm. Come on, man. Come on. And if it's God, you know, you, we heard stories of really when God moved, those people who just stood firm, they get hit by the Lord and they go down anyways. Then you know it's a real thing. Let's just not do those show anymore. Hallelujah. I'm preaching this morning. In Exodus, after Exodus, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13 to um, 18, it's, it's an account. I, I'm not gonna ha- I don't have time to go through it because I'm really, really cognizant of the time. It's an account of Moses responding to God's calling over his life to do this great thing, to begin to form a nation, to lead a group of people out of one country in slavery, to go to another land and to form a nation called Israel. And Moses, he was in the presence of God. And you know, I don't know if you heard people say this to you, you know, what would you ask the Lord if he would stand in front of you? Now, we're going to 2016. Many of you are contemplating, asking, what would you ask the Lord if he were to stand right in front of you? Hello, Robert. Have you prepared your requests? What if he say, what do you want? I don't know. God doesn't sound that way. I mean, I don't. It's just dramatization. What would you say? Here Moses, in everything that he could have asked for, he could have asked for wisdom, he could have asked for persuasion and persuasive ability because he got stuttering tongue. He could ask for power. He could ask for so many things to ensure success in his leadership. But he only asked for one thing. The glory and the presence of God everywhere he would go. Now, it's one thing to have a manifest presence of God when the saints gather together, which is awesome. I can't wait to see the true manifest presence of God. I don't even know what that is. I don't want to have a preconceived idea because if I do, then I'm locking God in in a box. I I don't know how how it's going to look like. You know, it may not. It most likely will not look like anything that we've seen before. 
Because revival usually come in a form that nobody recognizes. That's why everybody persecute that revival. So I don't know what it is, but I long to see the revive the manifest presence of God without the workings of people and human beings as saints gather together. But if the manifest presence of God and his glory is only available in the church, then we got a problem. The manifest presence of God cannot be only in churches, in the gatherings. The manifest presence of God must exist in your life every day and my life every day. As Moses had asked for the presence of God, not only when he would go into the tent of glory, but he asked that you will not leave me, that your presence will come with me, then reveal your glory to me. That's what Moses asked for. He said, I can do whatever you want, but I need this, your presence. Why? Why did he ask that? Why did he ask for the presence of God? Is he trying to impress God? You know, a lot of times I come to prayer, I, I myself find myself just trying to impress God when I really didn't need to because he's already very impressed with me. Hallelujah. Through, the, through Jesus. Yes or no? So I don't have to work at it trying to impress him. I come to his presence and begin to pray, and, and sometimes I find myself trying to impress him. Lord, you know, I love you. I don't need anything. Actually, I do need something, but I'm not going to say it, you know, just, just so that I look like I'm really, 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 really in love with you and sincere, and so all my needs, you know, I'm just going to mention it quickly. Oh, by the way, I just need a job, and okay, I praise you, worship you, you know. Was he trying to impress God? No, he wasn't. He didn't have to impress God. Was he trying to be spiritual? He was trying, he asked God, you know, he could ask God for supernatural provision, for favor, for supernatural wisdom. But instead he asked for the presence of God. As believers this morning, you can ask for the presence of God. See, Moses knew that God's presence and glory, when God's presence and glory is with him, he would be able to walk in the miraculous and ensure victory and success every single time. Let me, show, let me tell you this. If God's glory is revealed in your finances, wouldn't you think your finance will blow up? I mean, in a positive way. Are you here? Are you awake? Was it too much shopping? When God's glory and presence is in your family, there will be less fighting. There will be more peaceful. When God manifests himself in your job, wouldn't you think that you will be exceedingly successful? I mean, it's the glory we're talking about. When God's glory is manifested in your cancer, don't you think the cancer will disappear? Are you here this morning? When the presence of God is revealed in every and any struggle in your life, wouldn't you think miracles will happen? Well, the Holy Spirit and God had, in His Scripture, sorry, had invited the believers to do the same thing as Moses did, is to invite and seek His presence wherever you go. Just imagine 2016. God's glory infiltrates every aspect of your life. Wow. That would be heaven on earth. If God infiltrates, His glory invades your business, <laughs> you have no place to contain the supplies. Because He's an extravagant God. If He's involved in anything at all, He's not just going to make it marginally successful. He's going to make it extravagantly, exceedingly successful because it's His glory. So may we have the heart of saying, God, 
I need you to invade your glory, your manifest presence to invade in every area of my life. So the next question is how? Turn with me, read this one, Isaiah 42, verse 8. I'm coming to my concluding point. So you can go and continue your shopping this morning. God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give or you or share to no other, nor my praise for carved idols. Now, in the past, we had often looked at this scripture or took this scripture as God is very worried that his glory would be diminished if we were to take a part of it, a share of it. So he would guard his glory jealously as though there is limitation of his glory. That is how we looked at it, yes? Come on, think with me. When we read this scripture, we thought, okay, don't let us touch the glory of God because he doesn't like, doesn't like it. And so we be careful of not touching the glory of God. But you got to know the glory of God is so vast. It's like a drop in a, bar, drop, drop in a bucket of an ocean 10 trillion size of our earth. Whatever you can take in terms of his glory, if you can actually take it, is a drop in a bucket, or not in a bucket, in a, a, a small drop in, a, in an ocean the size, 10 trillion size of our earth, or eternity. There's no way we can ever, 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 ever diminish the glory of God. No way. So what does this mean? There is a secret lie in this scripture, lies in this scripture. God is absolutely secured. He's not insecure. He is very secure. This scripture is actually trying to reveal something about how, watch this, we can invite his presence and his glory into any situation of our lives. We're talking about one thing, God's glory to invade in every areas of our life. Yes? This is what he's saying. Unless it's all me, I won't get involved. Unless it's all me, I won't get involved. In other words, unless you seed or yield whatever that you need my glory to be revealed, you that area in my life, 100%, not 90%. Not 50%, not 40%, not even 99.9999%. Unless you yield that whatever, you know, a lot of Christians just say, oh God, I surrender to you. They only do it on Sunday or wherever they go to this great meeting with great orator and persuader, but persuasive preacher. They, they come and cry, oh God, I you that. <laughs> yes, all to Jesus. The minute they have an opportunity to get their hands involved, they will. Then you can never expect the glory of God being revealed. He will share none of his glory. In other words, in every situation, let's just say a cancer, a cancer patient. You know, I've often been asked to pray for cancer patient. And they will go, yeah, pray for me, you know, just in case. Well, then I... You know, I'm just being nice. I say, okay, but I would never go and pray for them. I was like, what a waste of time. When a person thinks that he can work out something on his own and let God work out something that they cannot do, some kind of partnership 
when they think like that, God will never get involved. There's a saying that, you know, try all you can, and at the end of yourself, God will get involved. That's not even scriptural. You know, you people, people say, you know, you know, we do what we can do, and God will do what we can't do. It sounds like there's a partnership. You go carry all the way yourself, all the way to the best you can, and then God will get involved. That is not scriptural. That is not from the Bible. That's a lie from human logic. Your doing, my doing, is the doing of obedience. You only do what the Father is doing. You only do what He tells you to do, not what preacher says that you should do, not what preacher misquoting the Bible tell you what you need to do. You hear from the Holy Spirit who lives inside you. Do you recognize, you understand? Come on, praise the Lord. When you hear the voice of God, you are not prone to manipulation and coercion of people. I know there are people in this church, you know, they hear stories of me, you know, one time, you know, I gave all that I have, you know, in, the, in, in, my, in my bank account, you know, I felt like God said, okay, just not all, but half of them, just give half of them, that was a lot. I thought, oh my goodness, I can't do this. But I obey what the Holy Spirit tell, told me to do. And then God blessed me with, woof. And then some sister went and copied that and, I didn't get anything. Well, hello, dummy. He didn't tell you to. Maybe the preacher could be very persuasive of the needs of the church or the ministry. And so we fell under that, and then we, we do what we do, and then we, we, we didn't see the results. We blame God when he was not involved in the first place. He will not share his glory. You know, a lot of times we hear testimony about how people get their prayer answer. And they always say, we give all the glory to God. But prior to that, they describe all the things that they did. They give him credit to themselves half the time or most of the time. And they just want to sound humble by finishing it off. I give all the praise to the Lord but look at what I did. We have to be careful with our testimony. Our testimony has to be, I really don't know what just happened, but it just happened. Then you give all the glory to God. You give, take no credits. You know, even ministry, we, we do the same thing. I used to do the same thing. I said, you know, we did this, we did this, but praise the Lord, you know, by the grace of God. I've been to all the church growth seminars, you know. They always tell us how they can, you can grow your church. And they say, this is what we did, you know. We fast 21 days. We do this. We do that. We did that. that, 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 that. People go, whoa, that's amazing. But we give praise to the Lord. Just like an afterthought. I told this church and I told everybody here I come in contact with. Whatever miracles happen in this church from now to eternity, explosion, revival, whatever, I want all my staff, all the leadership in this church, and now every member in this church, you ought to say, when people ask, what happened in your church? Our answer should be, oh, no, it's all him. I haven't got a clue. Unless he has all the glory, his glory will not be revealed in the place where you want him to reveal his glory. For finances, for relationship, for church growth, for healing. What are you saying, preachers? You will not take medicine or whatever. You do what you need to do, but if you, for even a hint, rely on what it is that you're doing, then you are trying to share space with the glory of God. The only you know, when I, what, what I'm preaching is not telling us to do nothing. Oh, I do nothing. I just wait for the glory. <laughs> I 
The Bible says little folding of hand, little slumber, poverty will catch up to you like a thief. We're not talking about slothfulness. We're talking about doing only what the Father is doing. So in 2016, if you want God to get involved, you know they say that God inhabits the praises of his people, yes? That's his presence, his glory. So then people go, oh, you know, therefore you worship. When you worship God, his presence will be manifested. Is it true? It is true. But what is worship? Worship is not musical instrument. They just a small part of it. They just the manifestation of what is already taking place. They are the they are the physical expression with what is already taking place. What do I mean by that? If your life is not a life of worship, you can sing all you want, honey. You'd be like Elton John singing all those nice music. Circle of Life, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, listen to Elton John. Oh my goodness. No, I don't have a CD. I just went to see those theater show, you know, movies. You know what I'm saying? If you're singing, I'm my singing is not the expression as, or of what already had taken place. We we just going through the act. We know different from people going to Justin Bieber concert and go. Ah! Probably that's the reason why many of us churches need to look like a concert when we do worship is so that we can have some sort of emotional experience. I'm not judging. Sorry, I'm not. But if what you do is the expression of what is already happening in your life, that is powerful. It's true, he inhabits the praises of people. A lot of our praises God is not inhabiting because we think praises is singing and playing instruments when that is just the expression of true worship in spirit and in truth. And the best form of worship is obedience. Making him the Lord of all. That's worship. And when you make him the Lord of all, I guarantee you, your, your expression will be so much more meaningful. You will see heaven shakes and you will see thunder, whatever. You know, ma magnificent display of God's glory. As you become completely yielded, you become his vessel of glory. Of course, he's going to reveal his glory through you. Of course, he's going to express his glory through you. It's so simple. We make it so complicated. Worship team, can you come on up? Father, we come before your presence this morning. We come to worship you. We come to honor you. We come to learn how to yield our lives to you. We're seeking for your glory to be revealed. We're seeking for your purpose to be revealed. Holy Spirit, I spoke in everything that you have impressed upon my heart to speak this morning. I view it to you, and so now I know your word is true. It will not return void. It will accomplish what it must. So we believe that is happening. Mindset, mindset had been shifted this morning. Ideas, Holy Spirit ideas had transformed our thinking. We will never think the same again about church, about ministry, about the glory of God. So, Father, if there's any area in our life this morning that is yet to be yielded 100% to you, I pray that you reveal that to us because you want to begin to reveal your glory in each and every area of our life. It may not be 
all at once, but in one area after another. So what is the first area that you're revealing to us, to you, to you fully this morning? What is one area in our lives that we have yet to reveal fully to you? So as the Holy Spirit revealed to you the one area that you need to yield to Him 100% for His glory to be revealed to you, I want you to take that time to speak to the Lord and make that commitment this morning. If you do want His glory to be revealed, one area, just one, you start one, and then later on you add more areas in your life that you want Him to get involved. But start one. Lord, what area in my life that is preventing you for the glory the glory of heaven to invade that area. What is it that one thing that I need to yield completely to you and I have not? What is it that I'm still holding back? And I pray that you reveal to me in Jesus' name and, and I will make the commitment that in 2016, I will just you and learn to you fully to you in that area. Whether it's, it's our health, whether it's our finances, whether that's our relationship, we learn to yield 100% to you. What does that mean? It means that you do not get involved. You don't get worried about it. You don't think about it, talk about it, or work at it. You just yield to the Lord until you hear His Holy Spirit tells you what to do. You just yield completely to Him. Be broken. Be surrendered unto the Lord. A sister came to me one time. She's so broken. She's crying out. And she's so, so she felt like the world had betrayed her. And for years, she was like always just so hurt and bitter. And one day I felt the Holy Spirit told me to tell her, Sister, it's not about you anymore. Until and unless you are crucified with Christ. And that you don't live in the life that you live. You live through the Son of God. Until you're completely dead in that area. In other words, you have no more control. God will not invade that space that you want Him to invade. So surrender and die to yourself. And say, Lord, it's all you, it's not me. And you surrender also the outcome, whatever the outcome is. That's what faith is. Faith is to absolutely surrender and be obedient. Abraham, we talk about all the heroes of faith. The key to their faith is not they repeat a few statements all the time every day. Faith is not that they, 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 they give money. That's not faith. Faith is they obeyed when they call upon to obey. By the Lord himself, not by people. By the Lord himself. So you walk in that, you will see supernatural outcome as the glory of God invade that space.